need some new Kamigawa Neon Dynasty cards? Well, you can get them from our amazing sponsor, Card Kingdom, by heading over to cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish and even get a free goldfish sticker. Just let them know you want one in your order notes and they'll hook you up. Hello, everyone. It's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive. And as you probably know, the last few days, we've been talking about Kamigawa Neon Dynasty in various constructed formats. We've covered standard and modern and historic. Well, today, we are jumping back to one of Magic's most powerful formats and talking about the top five Neo cards for Legacy with our resident eternal expert, Joe Dyer. Joe, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Seth. I'm doing great. Actually, the set looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, the set does look pretty insane for Legacy. So we got our top five cards. Actually, Joe came up with this list. So Joe's top five cards for the Legacy format. And I think this list, it looks really solid to me. Like sometimes we don't do a Legacy top five or top ten because the set just doesn't have a whole lot for Legacy. But I think this top five list, very, very likely to see quite a bit of play in the format. We got some really, really big additions. So I'm excited to count them down. And I guess we'll jump right into it and start at number five on our list, which is a random little uncommon experimental synthesizer. Just a one mana red artifact that when it enters or leaves the battlefield, lets you draw a card essentially. You gotta play it this turn, but still red card draw. And then you can sack it to make a samurai. I'm not sure how relevant that part is for Legacy. But Joe, what are you imagining with this little red uncommon in Legacy? Uh, so this is probably gonna see quite a bit of play in painter builds, probably with cards like Goblin Welder, Goblin Engineer. Uh, there's uh, a lot of those decks are now playing cards like Bray as Apprentice, uh, which you can sack this to Bray as Apprentice and basically draw two with it. So it's just a lot of incidental synergy and a lot of incidental card draw uh, in that kind of deck. Yeah, that's like a, a very, very steady source of card advantage. If your decks are built around getting artifacts in and out of the graveyard, sacrificing them for value. So it does seem like a, a really obvious addition there. Uh, do you think it has a chance outside of Goblin Welder decks? Like, is this a, a good enough standalone card? Or are you really specifically looking for decks that can like sack this for value more or less for this to see play? Yeah, I, th I think it's going to more likely be those kinds of decks. Unfortunately, it's it's kind of a niche card, but it's a good niche card. Uh, and that's what Legacy is about. And uh, for for play, uh, watchers, viewers, listeners who might not play a lot of Legacy, where does Painter fall in the meta right now? Is it like a, a top tier deck in Legacy? Yeah, I think Painter is like secretly like a really insane deck right now. Uh, there's a couple different variants. There's a green or no, there's a red variant. There's a mono red variant. There's a uh, mono white variant playing uh, cards like Oswald Fiddlebender from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, Ooh. and and there's also um, a green red variant, which is the green is kind of subtle uh, because uh, they're playing Once Upon a Time in the deck as a way to hedge getting cards uh, in card advantage uh, I... because things like Urza Saga and stuff like that have made a big splash in the deck interesting yeah i didn't realize like I i'm familiar with the more like traditional mostly like mono red painter style decks i didn't realize there were so many cool things going on with painter and legacy at the moment that's definitely sweet it's a sweet deck for sure <laughs> Well, let's move on to number four on our list. We have our first channel land, Atuara Soaring City. This is the blue channel land for four mana, or maybe less if you got a legendary uh, on the battlefield, a legendary creature. You can discard it to bounce an artifact creature, enchantment, or planeswalker. What do you think about this one, Joe? Uh, I think this is going to be good specifically in the eight cast decks that have uh, kind of popped up in the format in this past year. Uh, those decks play a lot of legendary creatures already. Uh, they play cards like Emery Lurker of the Lock, uh, Psy Master Thopterist. You could play Urza Lord High Artificer in those decks. So they're already playing legendaries enough to reduce the cost. And it's just a powerful effect for those decks to have a land that bounces something that may be a problem. Either it's a Collector Roof or a, a Null Rod or even just something as innocuous as being able to bounce a Teferi Time Raveler uh, without having to worry about it. Uh, being able to bounce an opposing Chalice of the Void uh, is like insane for that deck, because Chalice on zero for that deck is kind of brutal. 
Yeah, that's that's the first thing I thought of with this land, too, is this is like a main deck of a way to get rid of a hate card for a turn. And if you ever see combo decks, which I think eight cast would mostly count as like it's it's value and mid rangey, but it does have these huge turns. If you've ever played against it, where it just like mm. chains so many spells and does all this ridiculous stuff, uh, those decks tend to get shut down by like one specific hate card. This is a card that just answers anything for a turn. And if you're trying to have a really big turn, that's all you need a lot of the time is one turn without the hate card on the battlefield plus it technically doesn't say a permanent that your opponent controls so i guess in a pinch you could like pick up your thought monitor and recast it to draw Mm -hmm. more cards if you're fizzling or something which is kind of cute i guess i don't think that's your like goal with this card but it is something that might come up on occasion yeah you could definitely do that you could like end step bounce your on your opponent's turn and step bounce your uh thought monitor and then replay your thought monitor on your turn yeah how much that's, that's, that's cute <laughs> how much how much punishment is there for playing a land like this in legacy like uh, blood moon shows up on occasion there's wasteland but yeah i guess you're yeah. gonna be discarding this for value anyway like is being a non basic that makes one color of mana like a really big issue or isn't it that big of a deal that deck already plays like four copies of seed of the synod and like four <laughs> ancient tomb and four urza saga it's it's already definitely fairly soft to wasteland decks so uh, so at that point it, like what do you what what does it matter like what's another one right, on top of all right. that yeah <laughs> now now there could also be room for this in some of the loam decks like maybe as a one of uh, but i think uh, the other card we're going to talk about later on here is probably going to be better in those decks one more one more question before we move on how many of these would you play in something like eight cast because it is legendary is this something you're thinking of as like a one of free roll do you play more than that what, what do you think numbers wise probably just one yeah i would say not much downside as a one of really, because then you're never going to legend rule yourself. And as you said, the deck's already pretty soft to Blood Moon or whatever. So at that point, it doesn't really matter a whole lot if you got one more non basic. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> let's keep moving on. Number three on our list, we have a card that uh, has been getting a lot of hype is a combo piece containment construct. So containment construct. Two mana, two one. And when you discard a card, you can exile that card and play it. So what I've seen so far for this card, Joe, is uh, combos involving Artificer's Intuition, Tutor Amp Lion's yeah. Eye Diamonds. Is that mostly what we're thinking, this creating a new combo deck in the format? Yeah, I think this is going to definitely see a lot of play with Lion's Eye Diamond decks specifically. Uh, this It's just another card that kind of combos with Lion's Eye Diamond. <laughs> Yeah, being able to discard all of your cards and then just play them all is kind of kind of absurd. We've seen this in the past with Conspiracy Theorist, but I think the big difference is Conspiracy Theorist, not only is it red, so the colors are a little bit awkward, but it limits you to casting one of the cards that you discard, which means if you're discarding several cards to Lion's Eye Diamond, it's actually not that good. When this lets you cast all the cards that you discard, what do you think about the combo in specific? Like, I've seen this combo going around on social media. I actually did a short about it. Is that like a, a legit thing to go all in on trying to combo with this? Or are you just thinking, I'm playing LED, jam this in my deck for value? Yeah, I think that the combo probably isn't as good as it sounds. Uh, like generally when you start involving massive combo turns like that, it's generally not that great, especially when this is a combo that can be shut down by just simply uh, swords to plow sharing. Uh, the containment construct. <laughs> yeah, it does lose so. to kind of everything. It loses the force, mm-hmm. loses two swords to plowshare. So there's actually a lot of things. Artifact hate. There's a lot of things that actually can stop it. Force of vigor. Yeah, you you name it. Like there's so many things that kind of stops this. That uh, at that point, uh, if you're gonna play a glass cannon combo deck, you're probably wanting to play oops all spells. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm curious to see what this does. It, it looks like an interesting card. Uh, we'll just say that. Like I think it looks fun. And uh, I'm I'm always a fan of things that combo with Lion's Eye Diamond. Uh, I don't think this is Underworld Breach uh, by any means, uh, but I think this is going to be an amusing card. Well, let's keep moving on to number two on our list. We have the equipment version of Scavenging Goose, as it's been compared mm-hmm. to Lion Sash, one of the reconfigure equipment. So when I see this card, to me, it kind of screams Stoneforge package, uh, a one of that you grab against whatever reanimator or dredge or something. Is that what you're thinking, Joe? Uh, probably something for Stoneforge to find? This is Death and Taxes all the way. Uh, this card is going to be so good in Death and Taxes, it's not even funny. Uh, this, the Death and Taxes is already an 80 card deck at this point. Uh, they're all playing Yorion now. 
And uh, this card is just a great one of to put in that deck because it gets uh, tutored by eight things in the deck uh, between Stoneforge Mystic and Recruiter of the Guard. Uh, and then you can also put it into play with Stoneforge Mystic or Aether Vial on two. So everything about this card just lines up. And what's really big about this card is that it exiles it when you it gets bigger when you exile permanents. Uh, so it's not like scavenging is where you're specifically using it as graveyard hate against cards like, oh, you want to hit their Gressel brand or something like that. It's still going to be good in those scenarios, but this is really good at controlling things like Uro, uh, controlling, uh, you know, graveyard size for uh, Murktide Regent, because what's one of the biggest things that ends up in graveyards a lot in Legacy is lands. Mm -hmm. And you, so you can just eat their fetch lands, make this thing really big. Then you can just really quickly in like a good turn, equip this to something like uh, a germ token attached to a cauldron complete. Uh, and, it, yeah. and it just gets way bigger. This thing is just going to go really big, really fast. And it's just a really good card. Like this is, this is on the line of like very close to our number one card. Like it's, it's very close. Cause I think this is death and taxes. This is already one of the better decks in the current format. And I think that this is just a, a slam dunk for that deck. Uh, it's just going to be so good. Yeah, I think I think people might be underestimating how fast this is going to grow compared to scavenging use. As you mentioned, like uh, triggering on lands, growing off eating lands is really, really big in a format like Legacy, where there's way more lands in the graveyard most of the time than creatures. And then being able to stick it on the Calder complete on a flicker with some evasive creature and just getting one or two attacks for lethal uh, it seems pretty interesting. One thing I've noticed about death and taxes is uh, while it's pretty prisony, it's not always that good at closing out the game quickly. So this gives you a one of the not only works as a hate card, but also can be a really fast clock to just close out the game in a couple of turns. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Death of Texas wants the game to go long. So having a card that kind of can quickly close out games that might otherwise be unwinnable is pretty good. Well, let's move on to the number one card on our list. And you might have known it was coming because this card's been getting a ton of hype across formats since as soon as it was spoiled, honestly. Beseju who endures the green channel land, which for two mana blows up an artifact and enchantment or a non-basic. And the player gets to get a replacement land, uh, can even get a dual land, but still uh, blowing up a lot of relevant things on a, a land at a really cheap cost. What do you think about this one, Joe? Yeah, I think this card's going to definitely change legacy. Uh, it has a lot of potential. Uh, any deck that plugs to play cards like Life in the Loam, uh, there are decks play Witherbloom Command right now in the format. So any of those decks wants at least one or two, one or two copies of this card. Uh, there's, there's just no downside to this card uh, at all. Like it, it kills things like Trinisphere for less than three mana. It kills things like Chalice of the Void. Uh, sphere resistance it, it hits all of the things like uh blood moon uh for the you know lands decks that want to play this oh this is an answer to blood moon uh that's main deckable uh this is an answer to back to basics this is an answer to, <laughs> you name it this answers it and it's it's incredibly strong and uh, i i think it's gonna see a ton of play <laughs> Is someone who loves playing prison strategies, especially Blood Moon prison decks, uh, this card almost makes me a little bit sad because it's it seems so hard to play those lock game plans with this card floating around because it just answers things so cleanly. It's essentially uncounterable, so it's not going to get hit by force or whatever counter spells. I guess it gets stifled, but still, like it's very very hard to interact with. It does it in some speed. There, this card is just over the top. Uh, are you worried at all that this card could be too good for Legacy? I know there's been some talk about like, uh, oh yeah. And Legacy, Ren and Six is already banned, but in Modern, we've been talking about maybe Ren and Six is going to be too good with a card like this. Is there any chance this is, like, over-the-top good, or is Legacy powerful enough this is just another good card? I think this is borderline. Uh, I think it's really close to that line of being possibly too good, but uh, I really want to see what the format does with it first to really get that feel for it, because I think we really won't know exactly how super strong this is going to be until we start seeing events and start seeing people playing it and what kind of decks uh people play it in i know lands is obviously like a big thing that people are going to play in i'm sure like that we'll we'll see one show up in green white depths maybe uh any of these like bant uh control decks that are playing life in the loam or or the ones that are uh bant splashing black playing 
uh, Witherbloom Command are going to want to play this deck, this card. Uh, I'm sure it's going to show up a lot of places, but what that's going to do to the metagame, I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think it's going to be a good card for sure. Uh, I know our focus is legacy, but since I got you here and we're not doing a vintage countdown, um, what does this do to vintage in shops in specific? Because this like uh, also a format changer in vintage. Yeah, I think this is going to be very good in vintage. Uh, their biggest uh, thing that this deals with in current vintage is the fact that uh, Sphinx of the Steel Wind is currently the most played card and played creature in the format, uh, simply because of all the Tinker shells. And mm -hmm. I think what that will do is that will force people back off of Sphinx of the Steel Wind back to something like Blightsteel Colossus, uh, which is a much easier threat to deal with uh, for the current format than Sphinx. That's why everybody was on Sphinx, uh, because uh, there's so many cards that don't deal with Sphinx, like Force of Vigor can't hit it, Dak Faden can't hit it, those sorts of things, Assassin's Trophy can't hit it. So uh, there's so many things that don't deal with Sphinx, but deal cleanly enough with Blightsteel Colossus from uh, Oko to uh, Swords of Plowshares, that sort of thing, that I think people will back off of Sphinx. Uh, but Shops, the, I think Shops is always one of those decks where it generally doesn't matter how many cards are, can destroy what it, what it has in play. Uh, it sometimes just has those games where you don't have that card, and uh, it sometimes it has those games where it just rolls you. So... Uh, it's going to really depend. I think the aggro shops decks are probably better positioned against this card than uh, the slower prisony Golos decks. Uh, and this might be the final nail in the coffin for the, pr the slow prisony Golos decks. Interesting. Well, it's definitely going to be exciting to see what this card does because uh, it definitely has a really high power level and potential to change some of Magic's strongest formats. So anyway, I think that brings us to the end of our top five Kamigawa Neon Dynasty cards for Legacy. Uh, Joe, thanks so much for coming on and doing this. It's always fun to get a chance to talk older formats. Thank you for having me. It was great. This looks like a fun set and I'm really excited to see what happens with this. Ah, me too. It'll definitely be interesting to see what happens. So those have been our top five legacy cards from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Thanks again to Joe for coming on. Thanks to everyone for watching. And uh, tune in, I think, tomorrow as we talk about the next format. Not sure the exact order, but we'll finish up our top 10. So thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. And we will talk to you soon. Looking for even more Kamigawa Neon Dynasty coverage? Well, you can find some other awesome videos right here and here.